We're going to be celebrating by bringing back some of the more boisterous and provocative speakers in our next panel. It's called Back to the Future, and it begins right now. From Bravo, please welcome Lisa Shaw. ABC, Rick Mandler. CBS Interactive, Christy Tanner. And from Brave Ventures, Jesse Redniff. Well, thank you guys for coming back and being with us again. You guys have all been with us during our early years of TV Next. And, and you've all aged very well. Yes, very well. And Rick, you've been here from the very beginning. And all those very, different hairstyles. Our very first one. So what we did is we went back to the panels that you guys were all on back from 2012, and we pulled some of your sound bites. We want to take a look at them to just sort of go back over and say, have things sort of come to fruition? Have we made any progress? Um, against some of these challenges that you talked about you were facing back in 2012. So let's take a look. You can't get on-air web, mobile, and social together. So we had to hodgepodge a combination of sources. So just to name a few that are just being put into this one research pa package, Nielsen, Nielsen Panel, IAG, Dynamic Logic, Keller Fay, Bluefin General Sentiment, Trender, as well as our own primary research. Technology is just coming out where you can sync up to wherever you are. So, and then you can get the comments that were made exactly at the time by your friends at that exact time. So you can start to, you know, really sort them, curate according to what's meaningful to you. The notion of scale and how television really drives scale and how we like to think about how social media has scale too. But when you look at these things in relative terms, I'm not so, so sure yet. For a scripted show, the more you're engaging in secondary content, the more you're disengaging with the primary narrative, narrative flow. This tells me is that there's no one-size-fits-all social TV strategy. There's creativity and there's science, and much of what's happening in social TV may, may be more valuable on the creative side of things. More people are watching more live TV to avoid social spoilers. Shows aren't just being created anymore on the lot or just with the writers and producers. It's now a complete marketing, promotional, social effort across the board. My $500,000 digital campaign buying banners across all these various sites generated 50 million impressions, which only generated 40,000 click-throughs to my site. You know, you look at the value you're getting there, I'd rather go have those, you know, 200,000 really highly engaged people. <laughs> Lisa, I actually want to start with you. So you talked about multi-platform reporting and the challenges in understanding true viewership across channel, yeah. when, uh, cross channel storytelling. Has it gotten any better or are you still trying to hodgepodge it all together? Um, I, I think it's really improved and I think we're getting there, although we're not all the way yet there yet. I think total audience measurement, mm -hmm. the Nielsen thing, hopefully that holds a lot of promise. Um, and I think the ability to, you know, look at set top box data has made a lot of difference. I think social has made huge progress, so we're not only just looking at volume, we're looking at sentiment. And I think increasingly uh, places like uh, Place IQ, with, with the advent of mobile and you know, in, in that study, you, we kind of knew someone who went to the Toyota website. But now you can actually say, measure who, how many customers went to buy a car because you are following them on their mobile phone. So I think. We've really made a lot of progress in five years, but I really have yet to see complete total audience measurement across. And you still need, there's one thing, there's measurement, there's awareness, there's, you know, there, there, there's, a, you know, there's many different ways of measuring. So I still think you're going to need more. There's no so one size fits all. So what's that big piece that's missing? Uh, okay. I guess to follow the chain, really. I think that's part of it and completeness. Right? And, and this is not a knock on Nielsen because the technical ecosystem is so complex, it's almost impossible for them to have a one-size-all-fit solution. And the solutions they do have, SDKs inside your apps, are to a certain extent th things that the more complex operators, you know, the, the digital MVPDs or the you know, other platforms like, for example, YouTube, are not on board with. And so there's a fair amount that still needs to be worked through before you get to that completeness. And it's not just from that side, it's also from the agency side as well. So the agency is willing to accept other metrics to start trading on aside from the Nielsen metrics. What, what needs to happen, Christy, to get to that point? Like what's holding us back? 
Uh, fear of data is, is holding, <laughs> I think. Uh, cre the, you know, what a lot of people got into advertising, television, because it's fun and it's creative. And really what has, has started to run the business side of our business is this amorphous thing for many people, which is called data and sounds boring. And so it's not that thing that, that people say, oh, I just want to get into the data business. I'm desperate. <laughs> um, and, and, and yet it is increasingly becoming um, that which we're using to transact. Yeah. yeah, I think the challenge though is we don't all have the same data. So for years we all had Nielsen data and it's easy to transact on Nielsen data, but today we all have different data and it's expensive to buy data. Right. I, think you, I think that's exactly yeah. it, mm -hmm. that there was an ease of use when we all agreed on the same currency. Mm -hmm. And we can't, I mean, we can, at some point we will agree on the same currency again, but right now because of all the gaps and the holes in, in measurement, it's hard to have a unified currency. And you need a unified currency because it makes planning and buying you know, infinitely easier. And we're at that stage now where because you know, we're all sort of scared of the different data sets and the different ways that our content and our advertising campaigns are being measured, it's very hard to come to a, a common understanding. Jesse, is Nielsen going to be and remain that entity that will maintain that common currency? Uh, I think for the foreseeable future they will be, um, but you know, there are a lot of players that are coming up. You know, even um, you're, you're talking about you know, Viacom saying that they want to move 50% of all of their inventory that they're trading off of away from Nielsen measurement. Um, Linda, who's here today, is, is all about advancing the way that currency uh, measurement data is being valued and Nielsen, challenging Nielsen to bring it up to the next level or move on. So while they have a stronghold on the marketplace right now, I don't think they're going to remain the de facto monopolized business driving it all. Yeah, I think it's a question we're going to talk about a lot today and probably one that we're going to keep talking about over the next five years. Um, but let's switch gears for a second. And Rick, I'm going to go to you on this one. You questioned whether social media had the scale of television. Does it today? <laughs> um, it kind of depends on how you look at scale. In terms of, of a user base, for Facebook at least, not necessarily other social platforms, there's without question scale. But if you're looking for scale as an advertiser, especially with a video message that delivers sight, sound, and motion, not so much. There was a, a great uh, debunking piece that the VAB put out recently talking about uh, how you get reach and how you get video reach on Facebook and how some of the numbers that have been thrown about need to be looked at a little more closely. And, and I think that that's really a, the cautionary tale here, which is if you're looking to buy a video campaign that's equivalent of television, on social media, it's not really possible today. And, and by television, just to be clear, I mean the video <coughs> ecosystem. I don't yeah. just mean the live viewing on, on, a, you know, on a flat panel TV that's sitting on someone's yeah. living room wall. Jesse, do you agree? <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, I, I think that it all depends on which context you're asking the question. Um, I think that uh, addressable reach is very different than just pure reach. So when you think about things like Twitch, uh, the fact that they get a couple million concurrent people watching live streams of Twitch, um, that you know, eclipses probably 90% of the cable properties that are out there right now and the type of reach they're getting with their streaming mm -hmm. um, and their shows in their linear broadcast. So um, I think that when done properly and correctly, um, you can do it across YouTube, you can do it across Facebook, you can do it across Snapchat um, and drive 20, 30,000 concurrent people to engage with your story through the day it really depends on what your goals are. Thanks for giving a preview of our afternoon sessions. We have <laughs> Twitch, and we have a whole panel on addressability. There we go. That should be great. So, so one more question yeah. as it relates to the past. Christy, in the research you presented a few years back, you said 80% of people start watching a show because of an ad. What would you say, would you say that holds true today? Yes, I, w I mean, without having any new research, I would mm -hmm. say the number is probably pretty close. Mm -hmm. Now, it, maybe how we define an ad is different, uh, but it, it could be um, anything from, you know, I, I would say um, on air tune in ads mm -hmm. still hold a ton of sway and are very, very uh, effective, but we all are using many different methods. So a tweet from a brand or from a network or cable uh, outlet is an ad in, in my definition now. So 80% yeah. 
probably still holds I feel like the definition. You can also say content is a very effective marketing tool and mm -hmm. protect you know, potentially content, if you can consider that an ad, I feel like there's no better driver than fantastic content, whether it comes from a tweet or whether it's a content piece you pick up in Facebook or whatever, that is essentially an ad. Yeah, I think we, five years ago, we did not have showrunners live tweeting their shows and, and everything from scripted to unscripted to news programs, the showrunner of 48 hours mm -hmm. or the executive producer stays on Saturday nights and live tweets 48 hours. That was not happening five years ago. Um, and, and now we see it across the board. A huge percentage of the creative community is using social media to advertise their show. But do you see influencers outside of your controlled content that are driving people to watch programming? Yeah, that's oh, for the sure. power of your brand ambassadors, your super fans. You know, they themselves are the biggest marketing platform you have. You know, Lady Gaga, huge reality fan. Helpful. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> and her bacon dress. So we just talked about the past. Now let's move into the present. For us to have a discussion around the present, we're actually going to travel farther back in time to 2011. It was almost 2010 because it was January of 2011 at our very first TV Next. Rick, you were there. Yes, you was. guys were not there. You were at our second one. Um, you weren't on this particular panel, but there was a question that came through Twitter that asks, uh, what will we be talking about five years from now? Let's roll that clip because it's a little bit ominous. What uh, what will this panel be discussing five years? Oh, the big five years question. <laughs> five years from now, guys. Uh, Julie, what do you think? <laughs> I think we'll probably be talking about different applications, different devices, more devices, different ways to access your favorite content. But I hope that you know we'll still continue to talk about this TV being sort of the centerpiece to delivering that content to a mass audience. There won't be a content experience that doesn't execute without a social media experience attached to it in some way, fashion, or format. The understanding that people are going to have these two screen or three screen experiences. And then the other thing is I think that social and TV are going to integrate in ways we can hardly imagine right now. Uh, there's some indications, but we don't really know where it's going to go yet. It's already here. Um, you know, and Twitter and Facebook are the platforms that matter. I think in five years, uh, there will not be a, a brand around that asks the question, what is our social media strategy separate from what is our mass media strategy? They'll be able to answer the question, what's my media strategy? Here, here. And uh, in five years, we may be sitting here wondering, whatever happened to Twitter? Remember that company called Facebook? <laughs> <laughs> Here it is, five years so, later. So who purchased Bluefin? I know, yeah, exactly. that's the elephant in the room. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so Deb Roy's company, Bluefin, was acquired by Twitter, which is, which is pretty crazy when you think about it. Uh, and he's and like, he, stock price, please go up. <laughs> he, by the way, at that very first TV Next, his company hadn't even launched yet. Yeah. So we were being careful not to talk about Bluefin yeah. yet. Yeah. So, so, so much has happened in five years. Christy. Is television still the center of our media universe? I think video is the center of our, of our uh, media universe. And, and I think um, it's all entertainment. And so whether, uh, whether you're watching on Facebook or YouTube, <clears throat> we're all competing for that entertainment mindshare. Um, but I think also what, what strikes me about we're, we're only talking about Twitter and Facebook in that right. video, and we're only talking about Twitter and Facebook now, but Philo was on that panel, yeah. and there were a lot of social TV startups that came and went during the few years that, that have passed that didn't, didn't make it. Well, here's what's funny about that. Lisa, I want to get your opinion <clears throat> on this. Most of those startups that failed or pivoted uh, or got acquired, they were second screen apps. So they were the yeah. TV check-ins of the world. They were the social TV guides of the world. They don't really exist anymore. Yeah. What happened? Well, I think it was, it's a scale issue. It's like you can only control so many things in your universe, and people only have whatever they say, you know, an average of you know, 10 or less apps on their phone, whatever it is. So it's like you're in that atmosphere. And from our perspective, you know, we used to create social TV experiences that come to Bravo. Yeah. You know, to get scale, you really got to be where the fish are. So you know, we, 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 you know, it's out on Facebook. It's 
it's out on Twitter. You know, I also no longer am trying to get things real time. I was obsessed at that time of getting real time and be able to things tell real time. Now we'll have a show like Vanderpump Rules, which is on a Monday night, and we'll have an after show that's on Friday night. And it's really about continuing the conversation 24/7, seven, seven days a week, to keep them coming back next week. So. Um, you know, and also the on-demand nature makes it you can be, have that interactive experience anytime you want. So I think that social TV second screen exactly at the moment is less uh, needed less now. It, it was a, it was a kind of a flawed premise because we've time shifting and on-demand has really um, only increased. What? It's only increased over. <laughs> has there. increased, and that's that's really so personalized entertainment when you want it has turned out to be more important than being there at exactly the same time as everybody else when you know somebody somebody big character gets right, killed yeah. on a show uh, for for most most people so um, I think that's a very fair point and, it, and it, it's absolutely right on for about forty percent of the viewing right because still roughly sixty percent of the viewing depending on what show happens live okay. and there's a reason why even with that sixty percent we haven't seen the two screen ecosystem take off. And I carry the scars of the first round of this from, <laughs> from the late 1990s, early 2000s. My generation, second screen app. That was the second round of it <laughs> already. Um, we, we did ABC Enhanced TV for like Monday Night Football yeah. in, in 97, 98. Um, and, and what we learned then and, and what you know, the ecosystem, the venture capital ecosystem that put a lot of money into this learned again was one, People already have things that they are doing while they're watching television. Mm -hmm. They're using their email, they're on you know, Facebook, et cetera. And asking them to put those regularly used apps aside to engage in an app that's primarily attached to the show that they're watching is asking a lot. Sure. Right? And then the second thing is, it's a very high cognitive load to expect people to watch, especially scripted programming, to watch scripted programming and follow the narrative flow of that script, sure. and also then disengage from that narrative flow, and this is what I was talking about in the clip, and pick up their phone and do something that's related to that show. It's, you know, sometimes you just want to watch the show. Yeah. And then, but the incentives that, weren't necessarily big enough, right? So a lot of the check-ins were incentivizing people to watch those shows. You were getting points that you could redeem towards it was just became very complicated, and I don't think the rewards were big enough to get people really interested in doing that. No, I mean, just but I, I think if you look at what the shows that are popular, the stakes are too high to turn your eyeballs away. Right. So uh, the shows that are, are really capturing people's attention are the ones that just the action is super fast, and you can't you can't miss any of it. I, I went back and watched the pilot of Columbo this summer just for fun <laughs> with my uh, with my with my 13 year old, and he was going out of his mind. So it was so slow. It's actually pretty good if you have the patience. If you're in the mood, if it's uh, snowing or something, <laughs> it's it's amazing. But but um, um, it it took forever for him to solve the the mystery, and <laughs> I'm guessing it took less than an hour. <laughs> It was a double episode. It was the pilot. <laughs> so, <laughs> but uh, but but um, I think I think that's another it was another failing of all the social TV apps is that they were they were built on this premise that, that you could do two things at one time, which is hard. Right. And at the same time, showrunners have have become more competitive, and uh, shows have 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 become more action packed. And then I think I think there was a third element of a lot of the social TV startups that was a flawed premise, which is that independent VC-backed startup thought it was going to build its business and scale to heights uh, based on content created by really some of the smartest people in, in business in the whole world, which is Hollywood. And, and Hollywood was not yeah. going to give them the exclusive content that they, they thought they were going to get to support their apps. So I actually think that they did a lot of things correctly at the time as well, they were just a little too early. So, you know, when you think about the data that was generated by looking at how fans were engaging with real time, especially the super fans, in some cases you're getting panel sizes much larger than Nielsen. And when you're actually setting up those systems correctly using Facebook authentication, you can scrape the psychographic information and match it against 40,000 people that can currently connected with that experience while watching the show live, 
that's really powerful information. A lot of those players were setting that up. NBCU set that up five years ago and started putting that into marketplace. So it's not so much about them failing as much as in order to succeed, you have to fail, but iterate and grow and evolve. They help move the ball to the next phase. And it's not just Facebook and Twitter now. It's also Snapchat. It's also Shazam, which is around five years ago, is now one of the larger players in the space. So I think they helped move the ball further down the field. And maybe they didn't take it over the, you know, the goal line, but they helped move it along the field. We have just a few minutes left. So we're going to go quickly through the next segment, which is now traveling into the future uh, with a segment that we're calling Ripped from the headlines. Let's put up our first headline and get you guys to react to this. So this was very recent. Digital ad spending in the US surpasses television spending in 2016. That's a prediction. Rick, what do you think about that? I, I honestly think that the, the business isn't going to change as much. I, I've made predictions over the years. I've been going to conferences like this for longer than I care to, to reveal. And at Every conference there was sort of the demise of television or the radical disruption of television as a dominant meme in the discussion. And yet here we are today, and sure, television has changed a lot. The video ecosystem has changed a lot. It's not just live TV anymore. But it, ha it still looks a lot like it did back when we first started having these conversations. And so five years from now, sure, I think we'll see a lot more multi-platform consumption, a greater shift to on-demand viewing, a fair amount of addressable video advertising. But the, and, and probably, hopefully, a unifying currency across all these platforms. But I still think the business won't look all that much different than it does today. Interesting. Well, that's just two months from now. But let's go to the second headline. Is the next standardized media currency on the horizon? So as I said before, I think this is going to be a theme throughout the day today. Are we going to get there soon, or is it just too complicated and too many different players in this space for us to get to unification and standardization? I think we're all going to go through some, some growing pains in, in terms of the process of media planning and buying in the next, really in the next year. And, but along the way, we're, we're going to figure things out. If by horizon you mean three years, then yes. Okay. Fair enough. All right, what's the next headline? Facebook launches new bid to steal TV advertising dollars. We know they're making a big play. Jesse, why are new media companies so enamored with an old media? Um, Again, I think it's about capturing ad dollars. Yeah. So when they know that everyone is trading around that currency and around that scale and reach, um, Facebook has a arguable position to say we can go bigger, we can go more addressable, we can get you more data attached to it. I mean, even Nielsen bumps up all of their information against the Facebook SDK and token to figure out you know, what's the demographic information. Like That's part of sure. the whole total it up campaign is sure. using Facebook. So why not just use Facebook? There you go. The next headline. And last one. Media stock declines accelerate in Q3 amid growing fears of cord cutting. Obviously, media stock declines is a big issue, and there are a lot of different factors that drive that. Is cord cutting a big piece of this? Is it ratings declines? What's driving this? I mean, cord shaving is real, yes, but cord cutting, not really, because at the end of the day, you're still using the pipes to get the Wi-Fi and broadband into your home to watch the shows. So yesterday was a great example with Yahoo having the football game at 9.30 in the morning, I launched it on my Apple TV app, watched it in HD, and it was almost flawless. It kind of had a couple hiccups in it. Yep. But I still needed the cord to mm -hmm. watch the show. Mm -hmm. so. Last question and quick answers from each of you. What will this panel be talking about five oh, years no. from now? <laughs> I should have predicted this question. Subscription <laughs> models. I, I, yeah. I, I, I messed up your order, so, but yeah. I, I think uh, we'll be talking about how we made our various subscription models into a much bigger part of our business. Anyone else? I and how that fits into the ecosystem of regular TV watching. So e.g., yeah. what is it on that subscription channel, if the existing channel exists, that's complementary and different? Or are you trying to reach, let's say, let's say the younger Bravo, Bravo audience? And how do we do that? So since Star Wars is coming out with a new, <laughs> I'm going to borrow a line. I think we'll be talking about the Empire striking back. The, the MVPDs, I think, have woken up to the oh, challenge of uh, Netflix and the other SVOD systems. And so we'll be talking about what their response to those challenges will be. Yeah, I think we're going to be hearing a lot more about the microproducers, the, the, the new generation of media companies coming up to play and uh, how you aggregate, drive community around that, and then monetize that. This was a lot of fun, guys. Yeah. We're going to see you back here in 2020.